and uh, we can get rolling. I believe we are already recording. Yes, we are. Uh, not expecting a big group today, unfortunately. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to raise your hand. I'll take you off mute just by hitting the raise hand button. And uh, Rebecca, over to you to get us started. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so today, thanks again for joining us. We are going to dive deep into the teaming aspects of Polaris. This is a frequently uh, requested topic. Um, so I wanted to address some specific questions that we've received, as well as make sure people are clear on some of the guidance that GSA has put out to date. Uh, and I will just let you know, as we're going through, like Jeff said, if you have questions along the way, raise your hand, pop it in the chat, use the Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. And if we don't know the answer, because again, we're working off of a draft, um, we can go do some research and we'll we'll circle back with you uh, with, with whatever information we can find. So excited to have everybody here today. And we'll get rolling. So actually I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. He's gonna tell you a little bit about himself and Trident before we jump into the, the teaming aspects. Excellent. Yeah, my name is Jeff Everidge. I'm the president <clears throat> and uh, CEO, I guess, uh, President Lauren CEO of Trident Proposal Management. We're a 12 year old now, 11 and a half, 12 year old. We need, Rebecca, we need to know the exact birthday of Trident so we can get that exact age. But uh, over a decade of uh, helping large and small businesses do anything from identifying new contracts to bid through the capture strategy capture process and uh, writing and managing proposals. Uh, and so I'm a uh, I was a senior consultant at Bryce Tomorrow Scoopers, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So let's just move <laughs> on to you, Rebecca. <laughs> okay. If you want to introduce yourself. Sure. So, uh, yeah, Rebecca Wayland. Um, I'm going to be walking you through the, uh, like I said, the teaming aspects today of Polaris. Uh, and I've been focused on this opportunity since about March. So, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of iterations. Um, but what I want you to know about me is that I'm coming to this with a proposal management background. So uh, I've tried to take the view of thinking through what's going to keep you out of trouble, uh, what's going to cause you headaches, and the things that you can do to make the proposal response process as smooth as possible. Because uh, I've been in the trenches, I've been on the other side of things, uh, and there's there's a lot of pre-work that can save you pain later down the road. So um, just real, real broadly, you know, Jeff kind of mentioned uh, what Trident does and, and who we're about, but we, we do full life cycle support for our customers. So we're trying to bring aspects from every phase of capture uh, and response to, to our perspective here with, with what we're recommending uh, and with what we've seen teams struggle with and where we anticipate there being challenges. So uh, if you are here because of Polaris specifically, that's great, welcome. Um, but you might also think uh, to call us if you have another bid later down the road and you need help, we can surge in, uh, work with your team, you know, integrate as, as a resource uh, for you in those circumstances, um, aside from Polaris too. So this, is, this is not the only proposal service that we're offering. And so, Jeff, do you want me to run through? Uh, I know this is this is some upfront salesmanship here, but just to get everybody oh, yeah. in the right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, please. So just uh, upfront, we put in that we're we are selling a service or a couple of services that help out with Polaris specifically. And so we put that up front before we dive into the meat of what Rebecca's gonna describe here as we talk about the pros and cons of teaming for Polaris. Uh, but why would you want to outsource this in the first place? Uh, one is, is that you get that unbiased look at your viability. And that's a really important one. And that we're finding that as companies take us up on the service, we're, we're realizing that they're probably not in a position to win. And we're giving them what they need to do to get there. Uh, not much time to do that, but it's definitely better to learn now than later. And that unbiased look is an important one. And especially, I would say, unbiased and credible and experienced look. And that's what we give you. So alleviates the admin burden on your team. Why not keep them billing or doing higher value business development stuff while we take care of the Polaris bid? Evaluates you based on the latest guidance because as you'll see today, Rebecca is at the industry today. She's reading the new drafts. She's looking at the Q&As, all of it. She's asking questions of the government. Uh, 
and then connects you to potential teammates. Yes, we'll see that there's some upside and downside to having a teammate you haven't worked with before today, uh, but we have a pretty big stable of companies uh, that we work with and some of them might be a good fit for you. And then finally, get the decision done early. That's a key. Because if you don't qualify for, for, for Polaris, or if you do and you want to get ready, either way, make that decision as early as possible. Because my, you know, an early no bid decision is the best gift you can give your BB team and everybody. Like because you're not, you're as soon as you have a no bid, you're no longer expending scarce resources on something that's not going to be a win for you. So with that, I believe there's one more click there. We have. Uh, a couple of, there's actually a few packages, but the, the package that we think everybody should jump on now if they're thinking about Polaris is for basically in, in proposal world peanuts for less than $2,000, we will get you to a bid decision. So that includes uh, Rebecca and our team of analysts uh, reviewing what you have um, from a project perspective and giving you the nod that we think you should bid or telling you, yeah, maybe you should go for the no bid. So with that, Rebecca, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, I already introduced myself, so we'll get rolling here. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today, just a real quick recap of Polaris and what it is and what's been updated about it, because there have been some changes. Last week, GSA held an industry forum um, where they gave us some, some updates that may affect <laughs> how you plan for this and what you're doing right now uh, and through the end of the year. Um, we're gonna talk through what the permissible types of teaming relationships are. This is a question that we see come up over and over. Uh, we're gonna walk through some of the advantages and disadvantages of teaming and how teaming is gonna affect your score. And the way that we're gonna do this is I'm gonna give you a series of scenarios to walk you through how different relationships and experience portfolios could affect your, your total score. So there, I won't ask you all to do any math. I've done the math behind the scenes, but I'll at least run you through um, different permutations so that you understand as you're looking at your own company news experience and thinking through whether or not teaming makes sense, you know what to look for um, and how to identify that good teammate uh, so that you can put forward a, a winning bid going forward. Uh, and then as always in our webinars, we're gonna close out with some next steps and things that you can be doing right now to get ready, whether or not you use our services. Uh, this is, you know, we want, we want anybody who's pursuing this to, to be successful or to at least understand whether or not they can be successful uh, and make the best use of your time. Okay, so real quick update on Polaris. So this is coming out from GSA. Uh, it is a GWAC. It's going to be a multiple award IDIQ that is IT service centric. And this is one of the things that sets it apart from like the IT schedule, right? Uh, they are anticipating five-year base period plus extensions, and they have confirmed that there are going to be on-ramps. Now, the, the uh, way that they have described when these on-ramps will happen uh, is a little bit squishy. So they haven't committed to a set timeline, um, but what they have said is they will do this based on demand signals from government customers, uh, and it'll be as different small businesses graduate and make room for the competition, that's when they'll consider doing an on-ramp for the different pools. So I mentioned this is a small business set aside, and this is one of the things that's really unique about Polaris is that everybody on the team, on a team, needs to be a small business in this primary NICS code, which is 541512. They are gonna have four pools. The service disabled veteran owned small business pool was a recent addition. Uh, so we're gonna see a woman owned, sorry, woman owned small business pool, a hub zone pool, and then there's just a standard small business pool. And they're anticipating about 310 primes, uh, prime awards to go out. And we say about, because this is a points-based evaluation, which means that you, there is the potential for people to have tying scores. So uh, if there are, are people tied for the, the 80th spot, um, they'll both be awarded a prime contract and go from there. Uh, the GSA also let us know that this is not gonna be out before December uh, and they are considering pushing it to January just to get it off of people's minds until the start of the new year. Uh, we'll see, I think we're gonna see an update about what their final decision is pretty soon because they, they did a poll uh, after the industry forum and they sent everybody an email survey too, just asking for some feedback on that. You know, Would you rather have it in December and maybe have a little bit more time or have it in January? Um, my, my read is that the response time is gonna be between 40 and 60 days, probably closer to 60 days, because if you've dug into the draft RFP, you know that there are gonna be project template forms that you have to fill out that requires signature from the contracting officer who is the cognizant authority on the contract that basically validates what you're claiming. So anytime there's that exchange of, you know, relation or sorry, information between industry and government um, that they just recognize that that takes some time 
because everybody has day jobs, right? And Polaris is not everybody's number one focus, uh, except mine. So, hey, um, hey Rebecca, yeah. so you're telling me there's a contracting officer that's not hell bent to put out an RFP right before Thanksgiving or right before Christmas? I, they must have plans of their own. Yeah, they they've given us a pass this year. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. We should we should put them up for some sort of like contracting officer award. Yeah, humanitarian <laughs> recognition. I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. It's nice to to not have that that looming. Um, yeah. But there is some prep that you guys can still do. So, like I said, we'll cover that at the end. Um, but again, anticipating about a forty to sixty day response time because we know there's going to be questions. Uh, and just you can mark your calendars tentatively. We know also that after the final RP comes out, they they are going to have a session um, about a week afterwards to orient everybody to the submission portal because that's going to be unique for this opportunity. So there's going to be a lot of admin that soaks up that response time. So what I would like to encourage you to do is not think, oh, I don't have to worry about this till the final solicitation comes out. No, I think you're going to be busy during that period, keeping up with the Q&A and any amendments that come up uh, and, and changes that those Q&A drive with regards to what's scorable, what's not scorable, what's acceptable evidence, what's unacceptable evidence. Um, and I just, I suspect there's going to be some changes that, again, you have to be a little bit more dynamic for. So use this time now to prep. Uh, and like I said, at the end of the webinar, we'll cover some specific things that you can do to make sure that you're making the best use of this time. Okay, so now everybody's on the right plane. Uh, let's dive into the, the teaming relationships a little bit. So there's basically three ways that you can bid on Polaris. The first is as a solo company, right? You're one entity using only your experience. Um, and this is pretty straightforward, right? This is a, a pro of, of going this route is that you only have to worry about yourself. And if you've dug into the draft RP, you know there's a lot of little gotchas when it comes to um, what you need to do administratively to qualify. Uh, and the other pro of bidding by yourself is that you will not incur any point penalty for teaming with somebody that you haven't teamed with before. Uh, the downside, of course, is that if it's you going at this alone, you only have your experience to submit. So you, you want to have a pretty robust portfolio if you're considering this option so that you can put forward a competitive score. Uh, the next type of relationship is your very traditional prime sub. You could have multiple subcontractors on your team, but keep in mind that there is a penalty that applies if you have not worked with a teammate before. So the benefit of doing the traditional subprime teaming relationship is that obviously they can help complement your portfolio. So if you have three experience, uh, sorry, three qualifying projects and they, you know, your teammate has two, um, there are permutations of the scorecard in which you could uh, receive additional points for coverage across multiple NICS codes, um, point values for, for task orders that were of uh, you know, greater than $10 million. There's all different kinds of ways that you could bump up your overall score by relying on experience, both from your company and another company. But as I said, you, you have to have teamed before uh, and performed in the same, same manner that you're proposing that you will perform on Polaris in order to not face this penalty. Uh, and then the last category, they are right now saying that joint ventures, including mentor protégés, will be permitted on Polaris. Um, now, if you're wondering if you should form a traditional teaming relationship or a joint venture, something to keep in mind uh, about a, a, a potential advantage of forming a joint venture, uh, in addition to being able to use experience from either company, is that in volume four, all those certifications that we see around CMMI, ISO, or sorry, the sorry, the ISO, <laughs> CMMI, ISO, uh, and then um, having a cost approved accounting system uh, or an approved purchasing system, those can be from either vendor in a joint relation or joint venture relationship. If you're in a traditional prime sub relationship, only something that is in the name of the prime offer is gonna get you points in that category. Uh, one quick caveat, the exception there is the facility clearance. Right now, the way that the guidance is worded is that you will only receive credit for the lowest clearance level that both of you possess. So the clearance either needs to be in the name of the joint venture, which if you're not already formed and have this in writing is gonna be probably impossible to obtain, uh, or if both entities in the joint venture have a top secret clearance, then you'll get credit for having a top secret clearance. Um, okay, and then, so the downside there, again, is that you, you still have to have performed in some type of previous relationship, and we're going to define, we get into the definitions of that next. Um, you also have to be registered in a formal agreement, and everything needs to be updated as such in SAM uh, and in, um, in all the registrations. 
And Rich, I see your question. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, and then you also want to think through, we're just encouraging people, right, to think through the long-term implications because things like joint ventures and mentor protege relationships have shelf lives and there's limitations on how you can bid on contracts and how many and how long you can exist uh, in that relationship. So Polaris might be a strategic opportunity for your joint venture, um, but you, you just you don't want to lose sight of the other elements that could affect whether or not it's the right choice for you. Uh, so Rich, to, ask, to answer your question, it's an 8,500 point penalty, basically, if you are teaming with somebody that you have not teamed with previously. So it's, it's pretty big. And I'll, when we get into the point breakdowns, uh, I'll walk you through a little bit more of you know, exactly what that looks like and what you would have to do to compensate for the hit you're gonna take if you go that route. Uh, okay, so a little bit of motherhood and apple pie here um, with the, oops, sorry, we'll go, go back. Things to know about the, the joint venture. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to be separately identified and established. So you can't just tell the government, hey, we formed a joint venture, so trust us. But nope, you have to have the specific DUNS number, you have to have a cage code. Uh, and those are things that you, you still have time to get now. Um, but if you wait until the RFP drops, you're gonna be hard pressed to get everything buttoned down administratively in time for submission. Um, so you're, you need to be doing business in your own name. Uh, I mentioned you have to be registered in the system for award management. Um, the, if you're doing the mentor protege route, this still has to be certified and signed off by SBA, uh, and they're getting through these applications fairly quickly, but it can take a couple months to get that approval. So again, we mentioned this in case you're considering this option now, uh, you would want to definitely get this lined up ahead of RFP release. Uh, and then there's restrictions about how much work the JV has to do with the, as it relates to the different members. Um, making sure that you don't throw that balance out uh, when you actually go to bid on the task orders, because um, you do have to report back to SBA annually, you know, who's doing what, what you're up to, what the performance looks like. So it's not just as simple as, well, I'm looking at my experience, I'm looking at their experience, and with our experience and certifications combined, we can score really well on this. You actually have to think through the performance aspect and the delivery aspect uh, post IDIQ award. And Jeff, I saw you came off mute. Is there a, you have a question or? No, no, sorry. Okay, no, that's okay. Just wanna make sure I wasn't skipping over anything. Uh, okay, so frequently asked question that we see is, can I bid, can I, my company, bid solo on one track? So if you're a woman-owned small business, can you bid in the woman-owned small business pool? And can you form a joint venture uh, with another track, right? So if you wanted to bid in the hub zone pool, if you wanted to, to just bid as regular uh, small business or with a service disabled veteran-owned small business? And the short answer is yes. Uh, as long as the, the teaming is executed in accordance with the FAR, you can do that. So you can, you can propose on different tracks, uh, either as an independent company and then as part of a JV, because those are considered two separate entities. Um, one thing I will mention, and I'll, I'll kind of call an audible here. If you look at the draft RFP, the governing references that they cite right now, they cite the FAR, they cite the, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, and they cite small business or the, the SBA's guidance. Uh, and so when you're thinking through these teaming relationships, there's a lot of cross-referencing and pointing, you know, this, this reference will point to this one and say in accordance with this chapter, and you got to make sure there's you know, three other dependencies. Uh, so I mentioned that so that you, you understand that just reading one section of the RFP may not be sufficient to, to answer the question that you have about whether your teaming relationship is permissible, because there's obviously a lot of nuances when it comes to how companies are formed, how they deliver, how they're registered. Uh, and so you need to be familiar with all three references, which may or may not all be up to date, because uh, we, we did find a, a citation in the draft RP for a section of the CFR that no longer exists. Um, so I, I would just expect that there will be some some investigative work that needs to happen once we get the final RFP. Uh, and that's probably something that the Polaris team on the GSA side is working on now is just getting all the, the legal reviews done to make sure that they've cited the right things. Uh, because if there is, if there is an exception or a loophole, someone is going to find it and ask the question about it. Uh, okay, so moving on, another question that we hear all the time is, can a company subcontract with more than one prime? Uh, and the answer again is yes, you can. What we need to make sure you understand, though, is that if you are teaming with somebody, it's probably because you have a project that they would like to use, right? Or you have projects that yeah, you either have projects or you need their projects. You can only use a project once in a proposal in a pool 
Uh, and if GSA finds that you have given your contract that is a wonderful contract to multiple teams in, in the same pool, they will remove it from consideration for everybody and nobody will get those points. So the reason that they said in the same pool is because obviously if you are a woman-owned small business, you can qualify under the woman-owned small business pool and the small business pool. And in that case, you don't have to find separate projects for your proposal to bid in each pool. Um, but <laughs> you better not have given that project to any other team uh, who is also pursuing a small business award, just for example. Uh, okay, so this is where we dive into how these point penalties kind of come into play. Um, and it's it's section L.5.5.1 that's all about the organizational risk assessment. And there's two layers to this. I'll mention that up front. We'll dive into the first layer um, to start with. So the offer shall identify if it is previously performed in the same business arrangement as proposed. And the way that they define this is it's an individual company. So you're bidding on your own and on Polaris, you bid alone, so no problem. Uh, your bidding is a joint venture and the joint venture has performed one of the projects that you're submitting uh, or the prime contract, sorry, you were a prime and a sub on a previous uh, teammate. So an important distinction here is that this right now does not seem to include joint adjacent or sorry, adjacent subs, right? So if you, if you are teaming with a company where you were both subs on a contract and nobody was managing anybody else, right now that is not considered a um, one of the approved business arrangements. So just keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so how are they gonna determine if you've previously performed? Uh, again, if you've performed as an individual, that one's pretty straightforward. If you're a joint venture and you've previously performed on a contract for order, um, if, you, if all the members of the joint venture have previously performed together on a contract as a joint venture or in one of the other business arrangements, right? So if somebody else was the prime and, and the sub, uh, or if each proposed subcontractor has previously performed on a contract as a subcontractor to the offering prime. So couple couple things that are hidden here, right? If you have even one person on your team for Polaris that you have not worked with before in this in the proposed way, you're going to incur this penalty. Uh, if your joint venture was formed solely for the purpose of bidding on Polaris and you haven't worked with the other the other member entity of the JV, you're going to incur this penalty. And this is a big penalty when it comes to points. Uh, if you've looked at the scorecard, you know that for the hub zone, for the women-owned small business, and for the service-disabled veteran-owned small business pool, the max amount of points is 100,000. And for small business, it's 91,500. Uh, and this delta will take a big chunk out of that overall score. And again, because it's a points-based evaluation, GSA is not going to set a minimum qualifying score and say, okay, anybody over 70,000 points automatically gets the award. They're gonna work from the highest score to you know backwards basically. Uh, and anybody that's in the top 80 is gonna get the contract. And there's various quotas for the different pools, but just to just to give you that orientation, um, I think it's important that we, that we mention you know, why this is a big deal. Hey, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. On this note, um, this is this is new, right? We haven't seen a GWAC with this penalty like this before, right? Um, you know, I I have not, but I don't want to say that it's it's entirely new. I will say that it is a strong penalty, and I don't know that we've seen it in this magnitude before. Uh, but it is very very clear, and GSA or GSA has foot stomped this in every. Q&A and every industry forum that they've hosted that they want this to be for the true small businesses uh, and and for kind of known quantities. And so this is this is their mitigation to to do that. So yeah, and I was just thinking this this really just I just dawned on me on this that that we might consider that it'll be a lower point threshold because of this, because in the past when we've helped the teams have made the higher point scores. And teaming is definitely actually not going to create higher point scores, except for probably a few companies that have, you know, have solid teaming. Does that make sense? Like the thresholds, uh, the point threshold might be lower than we're considering. Right. And again, that's not something that they're going to publish because we're, we're getting, it's like getting graded on the curve, right? So yeah. they're not going to know what a good score is until they see uh, cumulatively what everybody is submitting. But yeah. what Jeff's alluding to is that this is gonna be a difficult thing for everybody. And so, you know, you may wanna consider 
what success could potentially look like. And it might not be a perfect score. You might not have to have a perfect score in order to qualify. It could be that, you know, every, every hub zone out there that does IT services is struggling to, to put out a, the breadth of portfolio coverage um, on their own. And so people are going to have to form teams in order to you know, put forward a better example. So I think this will start to become a little bit clearer too when we get into some of the scenarios. Uh, and there are still a couple other nuances that I want to make sure we get through. So I'm going to, I'm going to push um, but good, good point and definitely worth stopping to talk about. Uh, okay, so this is, this is a, an interesting one. Somebody asked, can you only use relevant experience references? So for your primary uh, projects and for emerging tech projects, do they only count if they were from subcontractors that you previously performed on a contract with? And the answer there is no. So if you worked with a business and you did some professional services contract, but you were a prime and they were a sub, you can still perform on Polaris together and not incur the point penalty. I wouldn't recommend putting that project forward because it's not going to be in an IT mix code. Uh, so you, it's going to be difficult to get it to qualify as a relevant experience. But the government will look at that and say, okay, you have lower risk because you performed as a prime and a sub before. So even though it wasn't in um, an IT service realm, even though it's not a contract that you're submitting as one of your past performance, right? Because you can kind of think about it like that. Um, we still assess, and I guess, sorry, I guess I could show you the answer here, um, but <laughs> yeah, we, you're not going to be assessed as being as high risk as somebody who's formed a team just for the purpose of players. And again, there are instances where it will make sense to do that. So I'm not trying to team you off from, or sorry, scare you off from teaming entirely. I just want you to understand when it's a good idea and when it's maybe not such a good idea. Uh, okay, so this is this what's in blue down here, right? Like you're not limited to only using those experiences, but you will receive additional consideration uh, for making sure that you previously performed in the proposed business arrangement. Um, okay, so this is another question that comes up. I have a relevant project that performed well part of a JV, but you're not bidding on Polaris as that JV. So can you use the experience that you gained while you were part of a JV? Uh, and the answer is yes, but again, don't forget only one member of that JV can use the project uh, in a given pool. So hopefully you've got a good relationship with whoever you are in that joint venture with, and you can have a conversation before both of you decide to submit it and try to get credit for it. Uh, one gray area that I do want to mention is that GSA has not confirmed if this experience will count as prime experience or subcontracting experience. In theory, what we're expecting to see is that this will be considered prime experience. That would make sense, right? Because the whole point of a joint venture is that you're both able to build out your experience portfolios. But I mention this because there are certain categories where you can earn additional points, but only on prime federal contracts. So for example, if you had a cost plus fixed fee task order, you can earn additional points for that if it was a prime contract for a federal customer. So this could be something where if you've got a project that's kind of on the border, you may not want to run the, found, or the final evaluation until we see the final RFP because that could skew how many points um, you're eligible for by up to 2000. So again, every, every point counts on these, uh, these types of GSA, or sorry, these, these types of uh, evaluations. Okay, so how would you prove that you have performed in the proposed relationship before? Uh, you're gonna have to submit the contract that you worked on previously and then evidence of that business arrangement. So whether that's the JV agreement uh, or a copy of the subcontract, you will be asked to provide that as part of your substantiating documentation with the Polaris submission. So again, you, they're not saying that you have to use whatever that project was to count towards your relevant experience, uh, but you do have to show proof that yes, you know, in black and white, on paper, signed by all the legal authorities, uh, you did exist in the in the the relationship that you're claiming. Um, one really important note: so if you are on an IDIQ contract or BPA but you never got any task orders, that is not enough to qualify. The other question that comes up a lot is, okay, well, we submitted uh, a proposal together. You know, we just, we just bid on something where we we're both teammates or where they were the prime and we're the sub, but it hasn't been awarded yet. Those are not gonna count. It has to be actual performance, you know, delivery of services, uh, you know, put, giving something to the government that was promised in a contractual form in order to, to make sure that you don't incur this 8,500 point penalty. Okay, now here's the good news, right? Can the prime contractor on Polaris, is what they didn't write here, but 
Can a prime contractor on Polaris add unnamed subcontractors to the master contract and or task order? So basically what they're asking is, is the team that you propose with the one that you're stuck with for execution? Uh, and the answer is no, right? The government gave us the obligatory, we want you to put forward your best solution, right? Your best teaming solution that's going to benefit everybody. Um, but then they basically said, yes, you can you can add people after a task order award. So if there is a company that you would like to do business with, but you run the numbers and it doesn't make sense to bid on them at the IDIQ level, keep them in mind or keep them in mind for the task order execution, because uh, you will have some flexibility to, to add contractors post IDIQ award. Okay, so now I want to run through some of the scenarios uh, and I'm going to ask for your patience ahead of time because there are some nuances here uh, that I want to make sure you don't miss. Um, so let's just say in this scenario, you are a woman owned small business. You have two qualifying relevant experience projects. One is in NICS code 518210, the other is in 541513. So you know you're going to get some baseline points for those. Let's say they're not especially big. They're not for you know federal contractor. You don't get any of the, the additional points. We're just keeping the math simple. Um, but you are going to get credit for coverage across two different NICS areas. Uh, you Both of your projects happen to include cybersecurity, and both of them cover a different emerging tech area. You are evaluating a potential teammate that you haven't worked with before, but they have a qualifying project in an area, a NICS code that you don't have, um, which means that you would not only get credit for their project, but you would be able to get additional points for coverage across three different NICS codes. Should you team with them? If you look at the numbers, your relevant experience project total is going to, you're going to get additional points if you team with them in that category, right? Because they're bringing a base base project. Uh, they're going to get you another thousand points because now instead of covering two NICS codes, you're covering three NICS codes. They're also going to bring a past performance. And we will assume for the purpose of this evaluation that it's at least a satisfactory score and they're going to be able to maximize that. You're going to take a hit in um, in this, this risk assessment, right? Because you have not teamed with them before. So your overall score is going to be lower than if you bid solo. Now, this was a little bit of a trick question, though, because don't forget, you have to have three qualifying experiences, relevant experiences, in order to be eligible for contract award. So in this case, yeah, you should probably team if they're your only option and you're interested at all in pursuing this. Uh, but I want to make sure that you know that when you crunch the numbers, you can't you know, selectively add things. So don't forget to subtract this penalty when you get to your total score. Because uh, it's, again, if you haven't teamed with them, there's there's no way around that. So any questions on that before we go to the next scenario? Okay. So next scenario is you're, again, a woman-owned small business. Uh, and this time you have four qualifying relevant experience projects. Uh, you So you're going to get that additional point boost for having four different NICS codes. Both of your projects include cybersecurity, so that's another 6,000 points, uh, and you can cover one emerging tech area on your own. And this potential teammate that you're looking at has, ooh, they've got that magic fifth NICS code that you don't have, right? So then you would get credit across coverage for all five NICS codes. What happens to your score if you team with, with this company? So in this case, again, you're going to get the plus up for having an additional project. You're going to get a 3,000 point plus up for completing all five, you know, you have the, 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 the magical, you know, full house at this point, because you've got all five NICS codes, um, no change to the emerging tech, because they're not bringing any of that. Uh, and then you get the additional points for the past performance, you are going to take a hit for the risk assessment, but you're going to end up with a higher score. So this is, this is a situation where, you know, it, it may not be um, as much of a boost as you were thinking, right? Because if you had teamed with this person, your score would be up by 9,000 points um, instead of up by only 2,400. So that's the difference between working with somebody you've worked with before and teaming with a new entity. And again, I know not everybody necessarily has those existing relationships, um, but it's really important to understand what the difference is between teaming with a known quantity and teaming with an unknown quantity. So what we're advising people is, you know, make sure that your teammates' experience complements your coverage uh, and helps you kind of level up in those additional point categories. Um, otherwise, you know, you're you're only going to see a marginal increase in your score. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot of admin that goes along with having somebody on the team because everybody has to meet the baseline eligibility requirements 
or Polaris, whether you're the prime or a sub. And those are not insignificant for every small business. Uh, okay, any questions on that? Okay, so another scenario, again, you're a woman owned small business, I might have a little bias here. Uh, you have all five qualifying relevant experiences. Congratulations, you've got a great portfolio and you can hit every single mix code. So you're gonna get the plus up for that. You have two projects that include cybersecurity and you can cover one of the emerging tech areas by yourself. Remember, there's a maximum of three emerging tech projects that you can submit. And you're looking at this teammate, oh, and they're so, they're so appealing because they can help you complete your scorecard because they have two complementary emerging technology projects. So you could have all five mixed codes and then three out of three emerging technology areas. Should you team with them? So <laughs> unfortunately, math, right? Uh, they're not going to move the needle on your relevant experience totals. They're not going to, they are going to move the needle slightly for your emerging technology projects. But one of the things that was really interesting when they finally gave us this draft scorecard is that a relevant experience project is worth 34, sorry, 3,450 points, while an emerging technology project is only worth a thousand. So even though emerging technology is one of the reasons that this new GWAC exists, right? Because we used to have Alliant 2 small business and they said, no, it's, it's not keeping up in addition to all the protests and problems that we've had with it. We need something else that gives government access to you know, cutting edge industry technology. Even though it's really important by the numbers, it's not as important as having previous performance um, in the five main areas. So you will see a point boost for these emerging technology portfolios but if you were to team with them, you would actually end up with a lower score than if you bid alone. So want to make sure everybody understands that. So again, make sure that if you are teaming with a company, their experience you know, complements what you're able to put forward on your own and that you actually crunch the numbers and don't forget about those volume five penalties that, uh, that you can incur. Okay, last scenario, your woman owned small business, and you have three projects of your own, um, and they're in different NICS codes. So you get the plus up for that, right? You've got two projects that include cybersecurity, and you can cover one emerging technology. Very similar to some of the other scenarios. You're looking at a teammate that can give you a qualifying relevant experience project, but it's in a NICS code you already have. So you're not going to see any plus up there. Should you team? This is another situation where you're actually worse off teaming with this company that if you haven't worked with them before, because even though you're going to see a point boost in your past performance, and even though you're going to see a point boost in your relevant experience project totals, it's not going to be enough to offset uh, what your overall penalty is with this 8,500 points. So again, as a proportion of 100,000 points, it doesn't seem like that much, but when it actually starts lowering your score, that can be a big deal. And we just want to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good in forming the relationships and um, that you're thinking through these things. So if you take nothing else away from this, make sure you understand that a new teaming relationship only makes sense if the projects and experience this teammate brings helps you actually capture extra points to offset the risk penalty that you're going to incur. So again, not saying don't do it, just be smart about when you do it. Uh, okay. And in case you thought that was the only way that teaming could bite you, there's one more thing I want to make sure that you guys are smart on. So let's let's flip the script a little bit. And this time you are a small business. You've got a healthy experience portfolio. You've got four projects on your own. You can cover cybersecurity. You can cover some of the emerging tech. You're looking pretty good on paper. And you've got this potential teammate that's a woman-owned small business. They really want to get on Polaris. You haven't worked with them before, but you, know, you, you would like to. You've been looking for an opportunity. You think, okay, maybe this is it. They've got a qualifying relevant experience project in an area you need, um, and they've got an emerging technology project in an area that you need, and there's no difference from you in volume four criteria. So this time, it, maybe the question is less about teaming, because maybe you know you do want to work with these guys in some form or fashion, um, but maybe you're thinking, ooh, they're a woman-owned small business, and they have access to a pool that's set aside specifically for them, so what if we made them the prime, uh, and then we submit in both the woman-owned small business pool and the small business pool? Would that make sense? The short answer is not necessarily because this is the second penalty that I, that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, if you are submitting a proposal in the woman-owned small business pool, the hub zone pool, or the service-disabled veteran-owned small business pool, 
you need to have, if you're the prime, at least 50% of the projects and not the emerging tech projects, those don't count in this, the relevant experience projects, 50% need to be from you. Otherwise you incur an additional 8,500 point penalty. So your overall score in the small business pool would be about 45,000, right? Just from the relevant experience. Uh, and then, but that's out of 91,500. And in the woman owned small business pool, it's gonna be 45,000 out of 100,000. So again, we talked about this earlier, you know, it doesn't mean don't do it. We just want you to be smart about what is and is not going to actually give you an advantage um, so that you are not under the mistaken impression that, you know, it's, it's an automatic like, oh, because I know sometimes in government contracting, that's what we do. We flip the prime and the sub in order to have somebody qualify for a specific set aside. They're really trying to discourage that where it doesn't make sense. So they want to know if you're if you're in one of these set aside categories that you can actually bring the bring the capability and bring the experience as the set aside uh, to perform the work. So just a couple other things here again, don't necessarily gain that point advantage. The other thing that I would really encourage you to think through if you're talking about who should be the prime and who should be the sub, don't lose sight of the fact that getting on the IDIQ is just step one. We're encouraging people to think through, like, how are you going to be successful for the life of this contract? It's coming out of the GSA, so there's going to be a minimum contracting threshold. Is your small business set aside set up to do that? Do they have the right infrastructure? Do they have somebody who is on staff, who is a senior direct employee of the company that can be the Polaris or program manager? Because that's one of the requirements, too. You know, there's certain events that they have to attend annually. There's certain representations that they have to make. Um, so thinking through who's got the better infrastructure, who can actually leverage this contract, and who's going to be able to put in um, the effort when, when it needs to be and where it needs to be put in to make sure that you don't get off ramped uh, and make a room or make room for somebody else on one of those on ramps. You know, we want you to get on Polaris and stay on Polaris. Uh, the other thing, this, this has come up on a couple other webinars, so I do also just want to make sure that we're clear on this. The point exclusion, the way to think about this is not that the points are getting subtracted from your score, because uh, when I get into the, the next slide where we talk about selecting a good teammate, you'll see we want you to build your score from the bottom up. So it's not that you start with 100,000 points and then we subtract 8,500. Um, it's that these points will just not ever be added to your score. So it's really more of an exclusion um, than, a, than a deduction, if that makes sense. So we can kind of jump into that, right? Because that's a, that's a good segue. So when you're self-assessing, please, 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 because this is points-based and depends on what you can prove, not just what you're claiming, we want you to start with a score of zero, right? You have no experience until you can prove otherwise. You are you're inexperienced until proven experience. So start with that score of zero and then build up gradually from there. And that's gonna make sure that you don't end up with an overinflated score uh, and then actually get assessed at, with, a, with a lower point tally than, than what you've got. Um, the next thing that you wanna do before you look externally outside the lifelines at all is make sure that you score each one of your projects individually and look at different project combinations to see where you can claim additional points. For some contracts, you might be able, if, even if it's coded in 541, 511, there might be enough overlap that you could take credit for 541, 512. Those two categories are very complementary. Um, same thing with facilities management or database services. Look at the NICS code definitions that are in the draft RP and see, you know, maybe if you have three, three projects that are all in the same NICS code, could something else with a straight face, right? Like we don't want to claim anything that's artificial, but could you get the CO to sign off on that project aligning to one of the other NICS codes? And then you get additional points. You still get to use both projects, but then you also get additional points for having diversity of coverage. That might be an option. Um, and then look at where you have gaps and redundancies in your NICS code coverage uh, in your emerging tech areas. And those are the holes that you should try to plug. So once you've looked internally, you've done that self-assessment, then you can start crunching your teaming numbers, right? And again, hopefully this, you picked up on this, look for someone you've worked with before, um, not someone who has worked adjacent with you in the space. Like, who did you, who did you subcontract with? Who was the prime? Who do you have a good relationship with uh, and, and prove, provable past experience that you could pursue Polaris with? You know, that's where you want to start. And then look at their projects. And by the way, because the documentation that you're going to have to submit is basically an FPDS report, um, plus some additional statements of work things, 80% of what you're getting graded on 
you're going to be able to look up on your own an FPDS. So if you are considering a teammate, ask them for the contract number for the experience that they would contribute and go look it up in FPDS. See if it was a task order, see what the value was, see what the runtime was, make sure that they're giving you a project that qualifies in terms of recency, right? Because if somebody has experience from seven years ago, that's outside the five-year window. That's not going to do you any good. Um, so there's a lot of information that's accessible to you if you know the right questions to ask ahead of time. So before you go down the road of committing yourself uh, and facing these penalties, just do a little bit of homework. And then in terms of you know, looking at the numbers, I will tell you the best way to boost your score is to high, have high value projects. So over $10 million um, with diversity across the NICS code or emerging technology areas, because as many areas as you can cover, uh, those all come with point boosts for being able to demonstrate diversity of services, basically. Okay, that was a lot of me talking. Are there any questions that anybody has uh, or anything you wanna dive into? before we move on. Drop the mic, Rebecca. <laughs> that was really, really comprehensive. That was really good. We really should charge people for these webinars. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, that was awesome. But I don't see any questions. Uh, I'm sure that the folks watching the recorded session are likely to have questions though. And, uh, We'll give you an email or you can do the contact us on our website uh, too, or you can just reply to those emails we send to your inbox uh, and uh, we'll uh, definitely answer your questions as well. But yes, I think we can move on. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so again, you've been on our webinars, you know, you've heard me preach about preparing now. Uh, confirm your eligibility and keep an eye on this because as we get revisions to the RFP between, you know, different iterations and then when the final comes out, we want to make sure that there's nothing that they change that would um, bump you out of the running. Uh, gather and evaluate these projects, right? Even if they're all in one NICS code, let's get them all in the get them all in the lineup. And by the way, we have free checklists on our website that you can go and download to help you check your own eligibility. They can help you evaluate your emerging technology projects, and they can help you evaluate your relevant experience. Um, to make sure that you're not thinking about a contract that is just outside the window, especially now that the RFP release has shifted, right? So if you had something that was right on the border, uh, sorry, you know, if they, if this delay that, or this delay rather could cost you that project. Um, so we want you to be aware of those, those pitfalls. Uh, conducting your gap analysis, looking for those gaps. What, what mix codes can you not cover on your own? What emerging technology areas would be complementary to your own? And then looking through your, your viability is a prime. Again, making sure that you are set up for long-term success. It's not just about IDIQ award. It's about being sure that you can win work on this uh, for the long run. And then look at your teaming options, because even though you might take a penalty, if it's somebody you haven't worked with, it could still be your best chance to get on this vehicle. And everybody who's going after Polaris is going to have to deal with the same penalty or the threat of this penalty, right? So uh, everybody's going to be in the same boat when it comes to overcoming this hurdle. And then gather and review your records. You've, you've heard me mention it wasn't on this webinar. We've, we've done other webinars where we dive in deep on evidence and what counts and what doesn't count. But basically, it doesn't matter what you think you did on a contract. It only matters what you can prove you did on a contract. So get those statements of work the award contract statements of work, not the solicitation statement of work that says what services you perform so that you can prove that one of the emerging technology areas was actually integral to the contract and that you can get points awarded for that. Uh, and you know, my, my favorite tagline is your proper prior planning prevents poor Polaris performance. And if you can say that five times fast, you're a, a better speaker than I am. So any questions on, uh, on this content before I turn it over to Jeff? Well, Richard didn't have a question, but he did put in there the just excellent presenter, and I, I agree totally. There is the flip side to the fact that it might come out in January, which is if you're working a IT services contract right now, get, maybe talk to the contract officer and get some of the billing into this year to get as big a number as you can. Uh, all right, so evaluating your PWIN. Well, yeah, we have the tools. You talked about that, the checklists yep. um, and other things on our website. Let's just move forward to course of action. So no bid, we can help you get to that decision. That's an important decision to get to quickly. It's one of the best things you could do for your BNP and your marketing budgets. Uh, bid alone, uh, we can clearly help you with that. 
a big part of the this Polaris Ready assessment is just getting you um, clear on where your point threshold is likely to be. And we'll literally, Rebecca and team will tell you exactly the type, type of teammate that you need to look for. So you can start looking. Uh, build a team, we can help with that as well, as far as you know, looking at who out there might be a good teammate, working to get you connected with them, and then be part of a team. We can help you with that as well. We do have a couple of primes that, like Rebecca says, needs more points. So you might be the unicorn they're looking for. Uh, regardless, next slide. Whatever you're up to, regardless, we can help. And we use our proven GWAC out of IQ process. This is a simplified version of it. Uh, you'll notice that it doesn't end with getting that award. It actually continues on to that PMO support. So one thing that we're gonna be offering our clients is uh, PMO support to just a couple of the clients that we help win uh, an award on Polaris. And the next slide, because we are low on time. I wanna finish definitely with an hour. There's three packages that we offer. So one of them is the Polaris Ready qualification check I've talked about. So Rebecca and team gather, helps you gather or you gather your paperwork, we get it together and do an assessment to see where we think you're at point wise. Uh, you can do a done for you proposal support that is going to increase from 20,000 to 25,000 on November 1st, as we get close to it. Uh, got seven packages left. We're doing 10 of those uh, max. Uh, and then post RP release proposal support. So if this thing comes out, one, uh, when this comes out, uh, and we haven't sold all our packages. We're going to bump it up to $30,000 because you guys have made it hard for us to get you ready. Uh, and we have to get things going in a hurry. So with that, go to the next slide. If you're interested in any of that, just hit us up either on our website, just contact us. It's Rebecca at Trident Proposals or Jeff at Trident Proposals. Reply to any of those pesky emails we've sent you if you're on our email list and let us know and we'll just uh we'll take you know sit on the phone with you and see if you if uh you think trident's or if, if trident's a good fit for you to help you out all right rebecca i'll just see if anyone has any more questions real quick yeah or if there's any topics that you guys want us to, to dive into next you know we're it, this is the benefit of working with a small business, right? Is that it's, it's a two-way conversation and we'll take any questions that you have um, in real time. Yeah, for sure. If there's anything you want to know more about, happy to- You can do it in the chat, it. in the, the Q&A, anywhere you want. Mike says, awesome job, Rebecca. Bravo, Zulu. I agree. Is it, uh, I'm almost thinking this is like three webinars. You had so much content. It was so- <laughs> Thorough and complete, and the woman. Don't have interdependencies, though. I I would feel yeah. negligent if I sent them out without the, the big picture. Yeah, for sure. Right on. All right. Well, let's end a couple minutes early. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for putting this together, and thanks everyone that came. And uh, yeah, this one's going to be recorded. This was recorded, so we're going to pop it on the website. Tell your friends that it's up there because that's a this is a a solid showing by Rebecca. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Okay, thanks everyone.